All right. It is good to be with you guys today. We're going to take 20 questions from the audience right now. And may I introduce the question counter? This is this is a new thing for us, but many times in the live chat, you guys are asking like, hey, uh, what question is he on? Well, we're on question number one. And so now we can keep track of our 20 questions as we go through. Today's first question comes from Dakota France. And the question is, what exactly does Jesus mean in Matthew 12 verses 1 through 8? When he says we must obey his commands, do we receive special rewards for obeying the Sabbath? And are we jeopardized for not obeying the Sabbath? Great question, Dakota. Okay, let's look at this passage. We're going to read it together, all eight verses, and let's see if we can think biblically about it. Um, if you're new here, uh, my name is Mike Winger. I am a pastor in Southern California, and my agenda and goal is to help people learn to think biblically about everything because I really think that it transforms and changes your life, rewards you in so many ways when you know what God is telling you and how he would have you think and live and um, protects you against so many problems that could crop up in life. and all. Anyway, just countless blessings from the Word of God. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, read Psalm 119 today. And you'll see. All right. So Jesus as Lord of the Sabbath, that's at least the title. But here, Matthew chapter 12, the actual text of scripture, not a title that, uh, you know, a publisher put there. It says, at the time, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples are not doing or doing, excuse me, what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now they had a ritual where you had to wash your hands before you could eat. And this is, this is, we'll call this religious nitpicking. Okay. That's not to say that it's wrong for religious people to say, Hey, that's a bad behavior. That's a good behavior. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is, this is, this is taking things into a bad place in this particular case. So this is not actually commanded in the old Testament. They're, they're taking a tradition. They, they say it's not lawful, but it's not actually in the laws of the Old Testament. This is their expansions of those laws, the extra rules. So the way that the they they considered these things, some rabbis, they would talk about this and they'd say like, well, there's there's the law, there's the Torah. And then what the rabbis do with the, with that's the written law, is with the oral law, the traditions, right? The additions to scripture. In fact, the word addition is in tradition, isn't it? <laughs> Interestingly enough. Sort of. Anyway, the uh, that's like a fence that they put around the law to make sure you don't violate the law. So they're going to make it even more strict. And that's what they did with this. So they're upset that Jesus' disciples aren't obeying this. And here's his response. He could easily just say, keep in mind, Jesus could easily just say, that's not in the law. That's your tradition. But he goes a, a lot further and he says something more profound. Verse 3, he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who are with him, but only for the priests. Or, and here comes a second example, have you not read in the law how the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? So these two examples, what, what he's saying here is like, here's an example of David. He's fleeing from Saul and he gets the bread from the temple. He, him and his men have fled without food. And they, they take that bread so they won't starve so that they can have the energy to continue fleeing because Saul's trying to kill them. The, the, the priest is the guy who gives them the bread and then he gets killed as a result. Saul persecutes and kills him. But what's interesting about this is that that was a violation of the law and Jesus is speaking about it as though it was okay. And then the priests, they're working on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, when everyone's resting, the priests actually have a lot of labor to do. So they work on the Sabbath. It's just like a, a pastor today. He's not resting when you go to church, you might be chilling, but for the people who are putting on the service, it's a lot of work and labor. And he says, but they're guiltless. Now, Jesus is not. This is where some uh, reckless people, I think, want to take scripture and suggest that Jesus is saying, see the law, you could just break the law. Don't worry about it. La shma. Like, no, Jesus thought every jot and tittle, right, was supposed to be obeyed. Every like dotted I, cross T, it was all important. But there's a principle, and many rabbis, even in Jesus' time, would have acknowledged it. And the principle is the idea that um, there are hierarchies of, of importance, okay? And so David's being hunted and he'll be killed. It's legitimate for him to violate the Sabbath. Legitimate because life is just that complicated. So if you're very much a very rules-minded, very, like, very, very strict rules-minded person... This might be a little bit harder to wrap your head around. Most of the time, your very rules-minded mentality keeps you safe because you're not playing games. You're not, you're not, you're, you know, there's the people who are super flexible. They're on the other end of the spectrum here. 
it's there's always an excuse to break a rule. It's always legit. But really, you know, I would limit those excuses to like human life is at stake or there's a clear command of God you're obeying. Don't use the law to stop the work of God in that sense. Um, but let's read on and let's connect this to the Sabbath because that's Dakota's question. Do we receive special rewards for obeying the Sabbath and are we jeopardized for not obeying the Sabbath? He goes on and says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. He's talking about the kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing, the himself and the kingdom he's, he's preaching. It's greater than the temple. That's a, that's a huge theological bomb Jesus himself is dropping right there. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So he's the boss of the Sabbath. This is These are such big words that Jesus is claiming for himself. Um, now, to answer your, the rest of your question, Dakota, I would actually go to other scripture. Okay, I would go to Romans 14. I would go to Galatians. And I would tell tell us two things. Just, just two things. We are not under the law. That's the first thing. We're not under the law. Read the book of Galatians. Romans 14, though, specifically talks about observing days like the Sabbath. And here's where we need to be flexible. You can observe the Sabbath if you want. You don't have to. Jesus is talking here in Matthew 12 to a group of Jewish people who are under the law, like they're legit under the law. So the debate about whether something's appropriate or not on the Sabbath is legit for them. But when we get to the gospel going to the Gentiles in the book of Acts, and we look about it in Romans, Galatians, we see that we're not under the law. So the Sabbath is not binding upon you. You can observe it if you like. It's not required. Is there a blessing in it? Well, there's definitely a blessing in taking time off. Okay, there's a blessing in that. There's also a nice thing in that you're doing it for the Lord. And Romans 14 approves of this. It's like, hey, if you observe the day, observe it to the Lord. Like, go ahead and, and do that for the Lord if you want. But we can't bind it on people. I don't want to look at the person who's not observing Sabbath and tell them you're missing out on a blessing. Because that's not true. That's not true. They're just not observing the day and it's to the Lord that they're not doing that and that's fine. So it's completely in Christian liberty whether we observe the Sabbath and how we how we might go about doing that. All right, Turka Oranzova says, um, Dear Mike, I struggle a lot with bad thoughts popping into my head out of nowhere. I'm kind of horrified and I don't agree with them. Is it possible they can come from the enemy? Any advice, please? Um, okay, so my opinion, I, I don't know if we have like really strong biblical teaching about what the limits of Satan's abilities are. Um, my impression is that he can like throw ideas at us. I think that that is possible. I think Satan can throw ideas at us. Um, and you might be like, well, that sounds really weird, Mike. But well, you know, I'm throwing ideas at you right now. Like I'm communicating to you. And perhaps say, there's a way in which Satan can do something like this. So I, I could give you an idea. I could tell you an idea. And I'm sort of forcing my thoughts upon you. But you don't have to accept them. They're just my thoughts. You can reject them. You can accept them. You can think about them. It's up to you. I think that Satan's like sort of fiery darts we read about in Ephesians. Um, I think some of those are thoughts and ideas. There's actually a scripture that says that Satan, quote, put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. There's also Jesus saying that when Peter, these are implications where Satan perhaps can throw ideas or thoughts at you, um, where Satan uh, tempts Jesus. He obviously does this in a very direct fashion, right? He's actually communicating with him in an audible way. But there's other places too where Jesus rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. There, there may, and this is very, like, I'm just this conjecture here, but there might be a hint that Satan's putting ideas into Peter's mind and Peter's leaning into those things. That's possible. I'm not saying that's my teaching. It's just possible. We also have, you know, things like a distressing spirit coming on, on Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament. And so there's ideas and thoughts he's having. We also have teachings. There's a lot of actually scripture on this stuff. We also have teaching that there's such things as doctrines of demons. That implies that the people teaching these doctrines are receiving some sort of informational inspiration coming from demons. All that to say, I think that collectively is a pretty strong case that Satan could put ideas in your head. Also, we have on a very human level, we have ideas that get in our heads because we've just thought things on our own in the past or we, we observed things. We were watching stuff. You know, your kid watches a horror movie and then at night he's having dreams and, and nightmares that were obviously inspired by the visuals and the horror movie that he watched. Okay, well, that's obviously, we go through human experiences that do that to us as well. So here's my counsel to you. It's possible it's Satan. It's possible it's just your past and your history. It's possible it's your own wicked heart. It's possible it's just passing things you've heard in the day. Um, my thought is this, is you can't control the initial thought coming into your mind, but Turka, what I would recommend is 
try to control your response to it. Don't sit there and obsessively think about the thought. We humans have despicable and terrible thoughts come to our minds. I do too. I'm with you there. And I think the counsel is don't obsess over the thought. Don't live in that place. Like, you know, if, if a bad image comes on screen, the solution is to flick away from it as quickly as possible. Not to stop and just go, let me just think about that image and that idea. You know what I mean? You want to move away from this thing. So this is where you want to take on Philippians. In fact, I'll take us to the passage in Philippians. This is good pastoral counsel for all of us, I think. And it tells us what to think about. And um, Philippians chapter 4. Four. Look, I even have a highlight there. <laughs> okay, I'll share this with us. Um, it gives us our thought life, like things to think about. Finally, brothers, and it gives us a list of things that you should be consciously thinking about. Whatever is true, what, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any thing, uh, anything of excellence, if, or if, if there's any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, think about these things. That's the counsel. So my advice to you, my counsel, you're just going to echo what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write here. Stop and think when you have a bad thought, think of a good thought. Think, okay, I, I, I realize I had that thought. I reject that thought. I'm not going to overanalyze it. I'm not going to be like, I have to figure out where it came from. Instead, think of a good thought. This is the same as getting a bad song out of your head. Right? You get a song stuck in your head. The way to get a bad song out of your head is to get another different song you like in your head. The quickest way to dislodge this bad song you don't want in your head is start singing a song you like. And then boom, it's gone. Start thinking of glorious things, wonderful things, truthful things. Don't meditate on the fact that you had the bad thought. That, that would be my counsel there. Don't become anxious about it. Realize it's a normal human struggle. And quickly move on to things that are awesome. So I, I actually sometimes have sat down and made a list. Like I'll go through Philippians 4 verse 8. And I'll actually make a list. So I'll be like, what is true? And I'll think of something true. Um, Jesus rose from the dead. What is something that's honorable? And I'll think like uh, being being a faithful husband is something that's honorable. I want to be a faithful husband to my bride. You know, uh, what is what is something that's just? And I'll actually make a list. And it's like pretty soon you find you flooded your mind with good things. So that's something I'd recommend. Uh, Drew's Bedad says, Drew by, Drewby's dad, Drewby's dad, I think. Uh, what is a local church and how should one be started? Many teach that it should be a plant under the authority of an existing church, but is that a biblical mandate? Thanks. Um, I think that a local church is when, I'm very simplistic here. There's just a group of Christians and they gather together and they they identify with each other in, in a communal, communal fashion, like not that they live in a commune, <laughs> commune, but they, they have like a community that they gather together on a regular basis. And there's a sense of a mutual accountability here. And they try to have like services or, or meetings where they, where they focus upon the word of God and worship and prayer and minister to each other. That's a local church that could happen in a living room that can happen in a big building. It can be a thousands of people. It can be five people. That's a local church. It doesn't have to be planted by a larger church. Nope. Nope. It's nice because there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. So anytime you're doing something in life, it's nice to have people who've done it before, who are experienced, who are thoughtful, who you respect. So that's good because there is a slight danger in the home church movement um, where the home church becomes like a strange totalitarian environment where there's like sort of little kings controlling everybody and their thoughts and everything's filtered through them. Like that can be, but it doesn't have to happen. I mean, that can happen in a mega church too. But sometimes through accountability to others outside of just those who are planting this fellowship, there can be like a balancing effect. But it can also be a choking effect because sometimes those overarching organizations are controlling the small churches in negative ways. Like even in, in different movements, there's times where you want to go plant a church and then your 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 local church, your local larger fellowship tells you, oh, you can't. You can't because they see you as competition. And to me, this is this is crazy. Like this is, I just don't get it. But they, they know from history, from their lives, that there's been times where a church is planted three miles away from another church. And because they're coming from that local church, they just take a bunch of really key members like of the, of the, of the serving community from that church and they, they go to the new church plant. So we can get defensive. We can be like, I don't want you to plant a church. You're just going to steal my people. And I think that it's, it's worth the risk of losing people to just be planting more churches. Like I think I default on just letting it all happen. So, but that can be an example of, I think what's unhealthy control over, 
um, where fellowships and churches can start. And, and if that happened to me, let's say I was planting a church, which I'm not, <laughs> I don't plan to, but let's say I was planting a church and my local fellowship was like, you're not allowed to go there. I would just, I would just be like, well, then I just won't identify with your fellowship. Like I'm going to go where I think a church needs to be and I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, those are some thoughts on that. The most important thing is that we just, I think that we, uh, when we start churches, those of us who do, you avoid the, the, the temptations of pride and arrogance, man, it, it just creeps right in where you're right about everything and you know, everything and you have to control everything. And, and then what happens shortly after church plants is often division within the very, the, the leaders who started that very plant because they just got too power hungry right about controlling everything and then they don't agree on everything so then they end up infighting and that happens a lot i think it's satan's way of trying to stop new movements and new things like that so the the best thing a church plant person could have is not only an attitude of faith but humility just just humility about themselves and about their calling and about their knowledge and about all those things but i'm answering more than you asked so i'll move on oh i didn't do my counter so that was question number three there we go and here's number four faith marie says how should, and maybe I'll move that thing. I'll, I'll figure out where I'm going to put that in the, in the long run here. Um, how should we as Christians rest in the presence of the Lord? Is there anything you do to be connected to him throughout the day? Um, that's an interesting phrase. So Faith Marie, um, there's something to the idea of like resting in the Lord. And um, and that's true. But, but we also sometimes can how do I say this? I, I hope I'm not speaking in ways that are confusing right now. We can sometimes oversimplify those things. So I don't think resting in the Lord means that you don't have any sort of anguish in your heart. And, and I didn't used to think that I used to think that, you know, the peace of God, and, and I sort of imagined like Jesus even going to the cross with like this super peaceful mentality. But as I read, and we're about to get there in the gospel of Mark, as I'm teaching it on Mondays, we're, we're getting very close to the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is like agonizing. I mean, he's, he's, he's in agony, ag great agony. And the rest in the Lord that he has is the, is the um, willingness to say, I'm still going to march forward. I'm still going to walk up and take the cross, but there's still this agony. Um, and so I think those things can coexist. I think you can be resting in the Lord while still having a lot of internal turmoil because you're going through hard times. It's okay to actually be feeling the hard times you're going through as a Christian. Can I give you permission? The way I look at it as a Christian is um, my rest in God, my peace in the Lord, it doesn't mean that I'm at a constant state of like Buddhist, you know, like, you know, whatever transcendental kind of peaceful moments. That's not really what it means. I don't think. And and I think if you do think this, then it, it turns pastors into weird people who have to always pretend <laughs> that they're in this perfect place. Um, I don't think that's the case. Like we're real people. We feel all these three-dimensional emotions and, and that's not a bad thing. So to me, imagine life is like a roller coaster. It goes up and down. You go up and down, up and down. And I think Christian peace and the peace of the Lord, it's like it puts a, 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 a bedrock on how low that roller coaster can go. So in a sense, here's my life. It's a roller coaster. Normally it would go up and down, but as a Christian, it goes down and it just kind of hits this spot where it just, there's certain things that no matter what's going on in my life, it can't take away these truths, right? So I still know, regardless of my current suffering, which is bringing me down, I know that God loves me. I know that he has forgiven me. I know that he has a plan, even though I don't understand it. And I, I'm not going to try to figure it out I, right now. It's just too confusing, but at least I know he's still good. Like there's a good God who I trust. I don't trust what's happening now, but I trust in his character. I know that my eternal joy is happening in the future. And sometimes that joy feels so far away, right? It feels so distant, but this is me. Sometimes I'm like not, I've never been in, in the garden like with Jesus, the agony he experienced, I don't think I've ever felt that, but I've definitely felt like the worst agony of my life, right? Where I've, I've been really low, but even then there was a bedrock beneath it as a Christian. That's what I think kind of that resting in the Lord is. Sometimes, um, we, we fall, we fall on God and we just lay there broken, but we would have fallen a lot lower if it hadn't been for him. And, and that's kind of how I see that whole rest in the Lord. Now, there is scripture that, that teaches, there's examples I tried to give you with Jesus, but also uh, Paul supports this, right? Where he says like, we're struck down, but not destroyed. He says we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. This is a really interesting phrase, right? We're perplexed. We're going through such trials, 
that we really are confused. Like Paul's really confused. He's like, I'm perplexed. I don't know what's going on. I'm confused, but I'm not in despair. I haven't lost hope. That's what I think. I think he's, he's low, but he's, he would be, he'd be a lot lower if it wasn't for his Christian hope. That hope is my bedrock, man. I can't get any lower than that because I have, I have eternal joy in life coming my way. So that would be how I process that now. Um, and I'd encourage you guys to, uh, be thinking about things like that. Let Christians go through their hard times. Just realize that God gives us, he's the rock we fall on. And if it wasn't for him, we would fall into the bottomless pit. Um, so quick announcement before we go to the next question. Our questions are full. We have no more questions for today. I've got all 20 here given to me already. So let's go to the next one. Question five, A.D. Chan says, does Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6 apply to Judas Iscariot? How else could Judas betray Jesus even after he had been enlightened and tasted of the heavenly gift and had partaken of the Holy Spirit? This is a famous, famous and extremely difficult passage. True story about Hebrews 6, and I'm not proud of it. <laughs> um, I was teaching Hebrews many years ago. It's not online. It's not recorded or anything. Many years ago to the, to the young adults group at my church. Back when I, before I was even a youth pastor, I was leading the young adults. And um, this was like 15 years ago or something. And I'm teaching through Hebrews and I got to Hebrews 6 and I had such a hard time with the passage, not knowing exactly how to interpret it properly, that I asked my senior pastor, Pastor Gary Ansdell, I was like, can you, can you teach for me that day? And he taught it for me and I just moved on to the next passage. It's the only time I've ever done that where I was just like, I'm just not going to teach this passage. I just, I studied it and studied it and studied it and just was like, I don't know. I'm not sure. So allow me to share some of my pain with you. <laughs> Hebrews chapter six, verses four through six. Um, for it is impossible in the case of those who've been once enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they're crucifying once again the son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. Okay. Let me offer, I think I have more clarity than I did years ago, 15 years ago, but I'm still not confident. Um, I may do Hebrews next after Mark. Actually, there's a good chance I'll do the book of Hebrews and then we will go through this passage and I'll spend as many hours as I have to, to, to come to the strongest conclusions I can. But let me just say this. First, let's ask this question. What does falling away mean in Hebrews 6? This is my tentative thing. If I teach this in the future, please take my future teaching as more thorough than what I'm about to tell you. Um, so they've fallen away. What does that mean? I think the fallen away is they've fallen away from Christianity as an apostasy. I don't think it's about sin in the sense of like, oh, you sin too much. Like you, you, you looked at bad images, you looked at pornography or you, you, you committed adultery. I don't think those are the terms here. I think falling away here is about apostasy. So that's, that's why he's like, Hey, we're going to, to intro this. He goes, I'm not going to reteach you all the basic doctrines of Christianity. That's what we get in verses one through three. I'm not going to reteach you all the basic doctrines of Christianity all over again, because if you fall away from this, if you abandon it, fall away, meaning leave apostate, you become apostate from the faith. Okay. So that's a faith issue, not a sin issue. Although it's a sin to be apostate. Yes. But just for clarity's sake, it's about doctrines. They've fallen away from that. Okay. Um, now if they do, then you can't restore them to repentance, which doesn't mean God won't forgive them. Actually, the text seems to be saying that they will never repent. I think it's a hardness in their hearts. I used to think when I first read this passage that it was like, God will never forgive you. No, no, it's you'll never repent. Okay, so it's impossible to restore them to repentance. Why? Because the level of the hardness of their heart is as though they have rejected Jesus all over again. It's as though they crucified him again when the Jews rejected Christ. It's as though they're doing this a second time. And at this point, it's like there's nothing left for you. Okay, so who is that being said, Hebrews 6, who is this about? Um... Is this about individuals who, if you leave the faith, you know, then you can't come back? Well, no, I mean, that's not, that's not realistic because we see repentant people who were Christians, right? At least in name and they claim the doctrines of Christianity and then they apostatized and then later they came back. So obviously they were renewed to repentance. They repented. So obviously they were back. That's not just them. No, it seems like a really elevated degree of leaving the faith, right? They've, they've done certain things. They've tasted the heavenly gift. They were enlightened. They have shared in the Holy Spirit, which seems to imply being born again, right? They tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then they fell away. Okay. So these are like 
Christians that have experienced like such intense work of the spirit in their lives and they know it and they know it and they know it and they reject it and now they're stuck in their sin. They're so self-hardened that they're not going to turn back to God. Okay, here's another possible view of this is that in Hebrews, he may be talking about um, Israel as a nation and not individuals. This is... This is a possibility, okay? One possible understanding of Hebrews 6, I'm not confident about it, but let me just give it to you since you asked. It may be this is not about Judas or your buddy Joe or you if you've turned and apostatized. Guess what? You're welcome back. Come back, man. Come back. Don't make any excuses. Just come back to Jesus. He loves you like a lot. But rather, this could be about Israel, right? Israel experienced these things. Israel experienced the, the enlightenment Right? They were given God's word. God spoke to them directly. They tasted the heavenly gift. Right? They, they, they experienced this, right? This is um, the tasting of the heavenly gift could refer to like um, the Red Sea crossing, the manna in the wilderness. It could refer to um, the, the Messiah coming to them. They tasted this. They had him in their midst and some people were following him, some were not. It could be more national than individual. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. Have they? Well, Yeah. I mean, Israel, at least as a nation, they had a share in the Holy Spirit that there's, there's at Pentecost, they were all Jews who were filled with the spirit in the, in the eyes of a bunch of Jews. So they had this evidence before them. So this may not refer to people that were saved and lost. It It might refer to a nation that received a certain amount of revelation and then has walked away. They tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. These could all apply to Israel nationally. Now, if that's the case, Hebrews six might be saying there's might, and I may well change my mind. Please consider this conjecture. It may be that Israel, it's saying of Israel as a nation, um, we're not able to get them all back on board. There are just those who have departed and we can't renew them to repentance. There's a great hardness of heart nationally that's in Israel. Okay, that might sound weak to some people and maybe it is. It is consistent though with Romans that speaks of a general hardness of heart that has come upon Israel because they've rejected the Messiah and it's because they've had all this enlightenment and experience. And so that is actually consistent and very much Hebrews is the theology of Paul, whether he wrote it or not. And so um, there's a possible explanation. Does it apply to Judas? Is it about Judas? I don't think it's about Judas. I don't think it's about any individual specifically. It seems very generic about those, some group of people. And so I'm applying that probably to Israel, maybe. And um, uh, Judas, I, I, would, I would hope Judas could repent. And my theory is this. Unless your heart is so hard you can't repent, God will forgive you. It's, it's me and my hardness of heart that means I'm never going to be saved. It's not God and his hardness of heart towards me. It's when my heart is so hard, I'm immovably stuck in my sin. And that is a possibility. We impact ourselves by our choices, including our own potentially hardened hearts. But I assume everyone's not there. Because why, why else would I? What if I encounter someone who's hard and I assume they're completely hardened forever? And then I mistreat them. No, I'm, I'm going to put the invitation out to everybody. And I think that we all should. All right, let's go to the next question. Number six, New Testament theologist says, how do you square Romans 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 15.22, among others, with 2 Thessalonians 1.9 and Matthew 25.46, among others, regarding the universe, the issue of universal salvation? I have my own thoughts, but I'm curious about yours. Okay, so when it comes to questions like this, where you're asking about four different texts and related texts, obviously this is too much to cover in a Q&A. So I'm just going to go to a couple of the verses you did bring up. And I'll give some thoughts on this. The nature of Q&A is that I'm able to answer questions quickly because I'm not answering them thoroughly where I'm going to do a whole like hour long video on a passage. Um, so I have to stick to that. But Romans 5.18, it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Um, so the, the universalist is going to suggest, okay, this, this is... Everyone in Adam fell and everyone in Christ will be saved. Um, what I'm going to suggest, my short answer is this, and I don't, I won't be able to go to all the verses for you, is that in this passage in particular, right, it's in Romans that it makes it clear that there are people that are not coming to Christ. They are rejecting Christ. So Romans conditions, I mean, look at Romans, back up, zoom out, right? Paul's going to say, take me in context. Romans conditions salvation on faith in Christ. Here he's speaking about the universal ability of Christ to save, about how everyone who's in Adam falls and everyone who's in Christ will rise. But he also makes it clear in Romans that not everyone is in Christ because you don't get in Christ without faith in Christ. So yes, um, Adam's fall applies to all of us because we're all in Adam, but not everyone's actually in Christ. 
So you could say everyone in Adam falls and everyone in Christ rises, but not everyone's in Christ, even though everyone is in Adam. That's the, that's the imbalance that's there. Um, not that I don't want to be a universalist. I mean, wouldn't we all love that to be the case? I just think it's not what scripture is teaching. Um, in 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, another verse you bring up. As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Again, uh, that's all those who are in Christ. Okay, we're all in Adam. Everybody's in Adam, whether you like it or not. But you have a choice about being in Christ. Again, that, that would be my understanding there. And it's these same, these same passages, these same books where he limits the benefits of Christ to those who have faith in Christ. So that's all consistent. Um, let's look at 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Since I'm able to move these through these pretty quick right now, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. This is referring to those who've rejected Christ. And so, so yeah, my view is that's consistent because they're not in Christ. Um, this may sound simplistic, but honestly, sometimes simple answers are simple because they're true. Matthew 25, 46, last verse. And these will go away into internal punishment, the righteous into eternal life. Yeah, I, I, I do think so. I think that that's, the typical Christian perspective on things, but I think it's also what scripture is telling us because even the very books, even in the context where it talks about all, you know, in Adam all die and Christ all rise, that kind of concept, it limits it to those who trust in Christ, right? It's, you know, Romans, the first chapter, the first one you brought up, Romans chapter um, 10 will say, that, remember, this is the same book. And if this, and if Romans, he's teaching universalism, it's weird that then he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. He's, he's wishing they would be saved. If he had confidence they would be saved, this is exactly where Paul would be like delighting in it, right? Paul would be like, oh, I'm so grateful that all of them are going to be saved anyways. No matter what they do right now, they'll eventually come to Christ. I'm so grateful for that. So if Paul in, in Romans 5 is trying to say that everyone's going to come to salvation, then why in Romans 10 is he agonizing? He says, in fact, um, um, oh, where's the passage where he says that he, he would wish himself a curse from Christ if it would bring them to Christ. Like his heart is broken because of their rejection of Christ. And so they're missing out. All right, we'll go to the next question now. And the number seven that actually helps me keep track too. <laughs> I like that. Um, the new, uh, okay. The invisible hand, sorry, the invisible hand. I started reading that last one. How absolute is the instruction in Hebrews 10 25 about meeting together? Are churches who go online only due to COVID and or government rules failing to live up to it? Okay. I, on these kinds of questions, I usually have a lot of caveats. And so I don't have a blanket yes, no answer for you. Um, I think life is very complicated and I think we have to acknowledge that just like I think Jesus did when he's like, Hey, yes, on the Sabbath, you don't, you don't do this. You don't do that. But yet the priests are working and everybody understands that's a different scenario yet. You know, David went in and everybody understands that was a different scenario. Human life is elevated above the value of the rest on the Sabbath or the, the excuse me, the showbread, the issue of the showbread in the temple or the tabernacle at the time. Um, so let's read the passage and let's say this, there's a general principle that's true applying it into the, into the very complicated life situations we find ourselves in, that's not always super easy. So we'll talk about that. Um, that we are to not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some. Um, it's acknowledged in scripture that it's a habit of people to stop gathering as Christians. And this usually happens in your local fellowship, your local church on Sunday mornings or whenever. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So we need to have like specifically not just Christians that meet. So if you get lunch with buddies and they're Christians, that's not the same as gathering as a church. I think to apply this verse to what we're doing, we have to be gathering for religious purposes. We're gathering as a church for, you know, us to use our spiritual gifts to build each other up. That's something that we miss a lot with our congregational gatherings nowadays. They're more stage-based and less individual-based. But I think there's also a stage thing. I think there's also a preaching of the word, a teaching of the word. It's assumed in churches that there are elders who are teaching the people. So teaching's going on. Worship of God should be going on. Prayer should be going on. Um, ministering to the needs of the saints. All of that stuff's going on. Should be going on for it to be considered this meet together thing. I think it has to be like something that looks a lot like a church service for it to qualify as this. It can happen in a living room. It can be four Christians together uh, in a basement of a house, in a cornfield in China. It can happen anywhere. It's just the intent and the some of the things you do. It may or may not look 
like the same liturgy as one group versus another. I don't think that's that important. I think the structure of the service is less important than having some key things, right? Teaching of, of the truth of the gospel of Christ, um, worshiping the Lord together, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, right? As Ephesians tells us. And then the body building each other up. So that as well. Now, what about COVID? Um, I think with COVID, there's an, or with any situation in life where you cannot gather for some reason, like you cannot gather, then God knows. The Lord understands this. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you live um, in an isolated area and there's nobody within 50 miles of you. That's just where you live. Like you literally cannot meet weekly with other Christians. And so you gather maybe once a month. You make the big trek out to go and be with believers and be part of a church service. And that's the best you can do. And I think you're trying to honor the Lord as you do that. Maybe you're you're unable to leave your home for some reason. Like you physically can't leave the house. Maybe you have an autoimmune disorder and you can't leave the house. And so you've been doing Zoom church services for like years because you literally can't leave the house. You can't bring people over because of some medical condition. I think you're doing the best you can and the Lord knows. But what about with COVID? And if you're thinking, they're telling me my church can't gather. They're telling me I shouldn't be able to even in some places, states are different, states are different, different countries are different. Should I just gather with my family and we do like a, a church, a focused church service? I think that would be a way to honor God. Should I gather with like one or two other families? Should we go to church in rebellion to the government? This is where I'm going to bow out of this conversation and say, look, you guys are in, I don't know if you know this, less than half my audience is in the U.S. You guys are all over the place and there are very different restrictions and rules in your different countries. And I'm going to ask you, just try to honor God the best you can here. I can't give you the hard and fast you have to meet as a church. You're not even a Christian if you're not meeting. Pastors are failing if they're not doing big, bold, open rebellion to the government rules that are going on. I don't know if that's the right answer. And I would leave it up to individual pastors and individual Christians to seriously evaluate their situations, weigh all the pros and cons, and seek to honor God the best way they can right now and follow their conscience on those issues. And um and I already know I'm going to get comments of people going, Mike, you, you, you're upsetting me because you're not answering the way I think you should answer here. Please share your answer. Let me ask you this. Don't just say I'm wrong in the comments. I mean, that's fine. You guys can do that all day long. It doesn't bother me at all. Tell us what your reasoning is. Get us on your side by walking us through carefully, not just claims, right? If you're not gathering, you're not a church. Okay. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> you didn't help anybody. But like, walk us through your reasoning here. Tell us why you think everybody should gather or why you think it's okay to not why you think it's okay to spend the next eight months not gathering as a church like i know this hurts people man i feel like we have to try to do at least something but how strongly do i rebel against current standards that i, I don't know exactly the right answers there uh lindsey kelsall question number eight says in the old testament i struggle with why god had israel kill thousands of people to take the promised land rather than just driving them out or trying to convert them thanks so much um yeah you're right to struggle with it i think that that's all kinds of reasons to struggle with the with the stuff that's going on there um it's especially hard when we with our current culture i don't think that we handle these things well let me let me just criticize our culture for a little bit here um when we show a video of, of and, and, and you're going to think that I'm trying to weigh in on um, on being pro-cop, anti-cop, and that's actually not my point. I, I ask you to transcend that discussion for a moment. So when you see a video of a cop and they're, t and they're violently taking down a criminal and some people react, they know nothing about the situation. They don't know what the guy did ahead of time. They don't know why the cop's doing it. They just know that the cop's violently grabbing the guy. And I'm not talking about um, uh, killing someone. I'm talking about violently restraining somebody according to like the correct procedures that they have in the police department, all that. Uh, when you see that, there's a lot of our people who respond as though that was wrong because there's somewhat of an, this is kind of weird, but there's somewhat of like an allergy to the issues of dealing with any kind of violence, especially violence that's coming from authorities. That's like a, a current cultural thing we're going through. And I don't think it's very healthy. I think we're overreacting. I think police abuse is a real, very real thing we should react to. But I think that the way people react to videos that have no context whatsoever and they cast major judgments, 
I think it's showing that they're not thinking clearly about these issues. Now, when we take this and we go to the Old Testament and it's basically watching a video and you're, you're highlighting the video moment where God's sending his own people in and they're eradicating individuals in the land. Like they're, they're killing people. If you read the text, at least the way I think it's, it, it is to be read, I think they're, we're probably exaggerating how much it was happening or how, uh, how many people it was that th those were probably, we're probably exaggerating that when we talk about it, but I think it happened. That being said, I get why it's a struggle. I still get why it's a struggle. When you take all of scripture, when you look at the, okay, let's look at the, 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 uh, the body cam footage, so to speak. If you take it all, you see that the people are very, very wicked. There's all kinds of things going on. Say the Canaanites, because this is the only time this happens really in the Bible where he commands the things you're talking about. It only happens one time when they're entering the land and then that's it. So in that moment when that's happening, the people of the, the Canaanites are horribly wicked. So they, they have like, for instance, this, this God, this idol that they would, they would take is a large idol with its arms out like this. And it's seated and it's sitting there with its hands out made of bronze. And they would heat this thing up. They put a fire under the hands of the idol and they would heat it up until they were red hot. And then they would take their living children and put them on the hand, the burning hands of this idol. This was like a practice they were doing in the land at the time. It was normal. This is one of the reasons why in the law, God's like, you will never offer your children to me. Like, I, I, I won't allow it because you're like, who would even think to do that? And you're like, no, no, that was their culture. They're doing that. Uh, bestiality was very common in the land. I wonder if STDs were running through the land. I wonder if one of the reasons why God wanted to just like eradicate this, nobody can be left in the land from these people is because of other issues like disease being spread and that being the way of quarantining or, or, or fixing that. That's possible. Um, there was also major ungodliness going on that God had given them hundreds of years to repent. If you zoom out at the dash cam footage or the body cam footage, God had given them hundreds of years to repent. He told Abraham years before, he's like, he had been working on them. And God doesn't just kill people. He sends his spirit to strive with man, scripture tells us. So it's not like God wasn't working with them. I would assume God sent them people and prophets and individuals who responded to God, who then just became persecuted by the people around them. So that being said, it was God's judgment on the people. God was judging a group of people. And if you think as a Christian that God has a right to judge people, then I think that's totally understandable. I think the part we have a hard time with is that he used people to do it. But then God does this with other things too. When he, when he tells a government that they should enact the death penalty on a murderer, this is pretty strong. I mean, he's telling people to kill other people. This is, this is pretty strong. Now in our current culture, where our, we don't like that. I think that's biblical. I have a whole video on the death penalty. You could, you could check that out too. I think when you zoom out, you realize it's not man just killing man in the name of God, right? This is God saying, your people are wicked. I've been striving with you for years. Your depravity has gotten to such a point that I'm eradicating your society. I don't want it to infect and mess up others. I also think for children who would have died at this time that they went to be eternally in the presence of God. So they had a temporary suffering moment and eternal joy afterward. And who knows what their life would be like if they were actually raised up in that environment. Now, I don't have the authority to do that to kids, but God God does. God has the authority to say, no, I'm just going to take you. I'm going to take you. Um, I have a video on children and their fate if, if they die uh, you know, below a certain age of awareness. And I have a video teaching on that. I believe they're in the presence of God for eternity. So they were spared in a sense. Now, I know if you want to use that as, a, as an excuse to go kill children, I'm just sorry. You're a moral like fool. Like if you think that's what I'm saying, that's not what I'm saying. You, you're, you're making some wild leaps. You're basically making yourself God to say that. So, um, uh, finally, Lindsay, I'll say this, the emphasis in scripture, and I save this to the end because I wanted to deal head on with the things you're saying. The emphasis in scripture is not killing groups of people. The emphasis is actually driving them out. And this is the command over and over again, drive them out of the land, drive them out of the land. And it seems that God put by his spirit an awareness in the people that they were going to lose these battles, right? When Rahab comes, she's like, I already know we're going to lose. Like we know we're going to lose. So there's this active rebellion against God that they're experiencing when they, when they don't just get out and leave. So the emphasis is driving out of the land and many of the places where like uh, the, I'll get rid of all the Amalekites over here in this city. Those were actually like fortress cities. Like they're not just city cities. They're military po outposts is more what they are. These are some things to help soften our understanding of what's going on there. Finally, I'll say this. If you guys are thinking, Mike, those are interesting, thoughtful. I want to hear more about it, but I'm not really satisfied. That's okay. You don't have to be satisfied by what I said. My last thought is this, at least trust in God's goodness and say, God, you're both the authority of the universe, the authority over life and death. Like rightly so, you could say, I'm taking you out. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you life. God has the authority to do this. And I trust your goodness. You've revealed your goodness and love in Christ. I'm not going to doubt that. 
You tell me you, you made these judgments. I don't understand them. I'm just going to reserve judgment on that and I'm going to trust in your goodness. And I think that's fair if that's the only thing you can do left for your own heart, uh, Lindsay or others who might feel the same way. I think God had justifications for the things he did, even though they are tough for us, especially in our modern culture, to swallow. Um, and hopefully some of the stuff I've sh shared with you has helped. Terry DeFilo has a question. And uh, what's funny is all this mentioned, I was recently criticized by somebody who um, will go unnamed that I, I'm afraid of people questioning Christian beliefs <laughs> and that, and that I'm scared. I'm scared. Uh, I want you to be scared to question your beliefs or to question things that you think. And it, it was just hilarious to me. I thought of just now as I was answering this last very hard question. Uh, Terry Drafilo says, or Drafilho, I don't know how to pronounce it. Your name, sorry, Terry. In Luke 18 and 34, both Zacharias and Mary, oh, Luke 1, verses 18 and 34, Zacharias and Mary questioned Gabriel when he told them of their future offspring. So why is Zacharias disciplined for his question? Love your teaching ministry. Thank you. You're very welcome, Terry. Let's look at these. And I think it's actually so human. I love this stuff. This is one of the things I love about scripture. Most religious groups, when you read into their doctrines and beliefs, it's like people turn into like these... um these caricatures. It's like people aren't real. It's like life isn't really three-dimensional. And and it's all just, I don't know how, how else to describe it, but I, I look at other religious writings and things and I'm like, what kind of version of people do you think you're dealing with here? But scripture often deals with like the nuances of humanity and the way we feel about things and how, we're, how we are real. And this is a good example of that. So Luke 1.18, uh, Zechariah is told that he's going to have a kid and his, his wife is old and he's like, um, you know, how's this going to be? So, you know, he's told by an angel, this is, this is, this is John the Baptist's dad. He's told that he's going to have a kid. And he's like, I don't understand. How's this, how's this even going to happen? How will this be? And so he asks the question, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. An angel from God has appeared to Zechariah. When he says, how shall I know this? It's implied that he's doubting. He doesn't believe it's true. So he's an angel from God and he doesn't believe it. Okay, if I had an angel from God appear to me and speak to me and he's and he's and he's ministering in the temple at the time, like it is clear, the context clearly shows him this is God speaking to him. And then the angel says, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring to you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So Zechariah, his his question, how shall I know this, was based on I don't believe you. Prove it to me. I don't believe you. Um and, and in the face of seeing a messenger, okay, it's fine when someone goes, Mike, I don't believe you. That's fine. I'm talking about like an angel from the presence of God reveals himself to you in glory and says, this is going to happen. And you're like, that seems unlikely to me, you know. So then as we go down to verse 33, um, the, the angel Gabriel, same angel, comes and tells Mary that she's going to have a son. Not John the Baptist. That's what Zechariah, his, his kid's going to be. But um, she's going to have a son and it will be Jesus, right? The most high. And her response her response is different. Verse 34, how will this be since I'm a virgin? I mean, you know, John says something really similar. He goes, or John's dad, Zacharias, he's like, how will I know this? I'm an old man. She goes, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She actually is different than John, or than John's dad, Zechariah. She's not saying, prove it to me. I don't believe you. She's saying like, what's the process here? I'm a virgin. Do you get it? It's a question about comprehension. It's not a question about belief. She believes him. She just doesn't understand. And so she's asking questions about it. She's not questioning it in that negative kind of critical sense. And this is so human of us. Online, I get questions all the time from people, in, even in, even right now. Some of the questions today might be from people who are like, help me understand this. Like the last one, I, I, it was a very tough question, but I think it was a help me understand this question. Whereas this question um, with, with Mary is just like that. And then Zechariah, his questions like, oh yeah, prove it, prove it. It's, it's kind of the skeptical response. So there's a heart issue that's going on there. Um, and we can have our heart issues, even in our questions. So it's good to ask questions, but the question is, what's behind my question? So then the angel explains, okay, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, Mary. God's going to, God's going to supernaturally make you pregnant. This is what's going to happen. You will still be a virgin in other words. And uh, and then Mary's response is, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. She just believes him at his word. Whereas um, that wasn't the case with Zechariah. All right, let's go to the next question. Dominique Cohn says, can we anger God to the point where he never forgives? Um, 
I, I, I would say my answer to that is going to be no. And let me explain. When I say, um, I'm so angry, I'll never forgive you. That means regardless of what you do, regardless of your apologies, regardless of your repentance, regardless of your future kindness, I still will not forgive you because the reason for my unforgiveness is rooted in my anger. And I'm going to suggest uh, that never happens to God, that the, the reason for him not forgiving is us rejecting his forgiveness. That the, the cross goes, I mean, look at Jesus on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Look at the father sending his son to Israel, who is a rebellious nation. Jesus, in the flesh, when he's there living his life on the earth, he says, how long will I be, will I be with this rebellious generation? I mean, there's just so much to just, dis and I mean, to the eyes of Jesus, his perfectly holy eyes, right? The more godly you are, the more you, uh, you notice ungodliness. I can't even imagine how much sin Jesus is constantly aware of around him from his disciples, from his own followers, from those who are like, Hey Jesus, I'm following you. I'm doing great. And he's just like thinking, I know all your issues. You got so many problems. God's anger towards us is turned away the moment we put our faith in Christ. And if we reject the forgiveness of Christ, it is his justice and his goodness, not like a petty, angry response, like God's emotionally overwhelmed with, I'm just mad at you, but rather it's his goodness and justice, like a just judge dropping the gavel. Okay, here comes the judgment of your sin. It even says in scripture that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Even if he's the one destroying the wicked, he's not enjoying that. There's no sort of maliciousness, malicious intent in God. It's justice that goes on there. So can we anger God to the point where he never forgives? No, I think we can get ourselves so hardened to the point where we would never accept his forgiveness. That's the scary thing. It, it's the human heart that's the scary thing, not God's heart. Next question, it's flawless, says, I'm an agnostic. I'm an agnostic trying to believe. How would you recommend someone should approach this? I'm reading through the Bible. I started with John, as some recommend, but my heart hasn't changed yet. Any advice? Um, uh, First, it's flawless. You guys pray for it's flawless. Pray for this person, this man or woman. I, I'm I'm very excited to hear that. Okay, I'm happy. I'm very glad you're on this journey. You said you're you're an agnostic trying to believe, which I'm assuming you mean. I want to believe like because it's true. Like I don't just want to like have a religion here. I want to have solid factual truth. So um, one of the things you might consider doing, I'm going to give you a, lo a list of things you might consider, is first just continue reading the word. Continue reading John. I wouldn't. Um, hang too much on having like a special moment, like a zapping kind of moment that's going on. Uh, read John as though you're learning about who Jesus is. You're learning what he said. You're learning what he's done. You're learning the story of who Christ is. That's important. Um, I would start praying. Start praying. I mean, you know, from you as an agnostic, worst case scenario, you're just talking to yourself. Best case scenario, you're reaching out to the God of creation and you're praying and you're asking him for help. And you're just going to patiently continue in that. Not trying to stir up just your emotions, right? You're actually asking God, help me to understand who you are. Help me to see the truth. Help take the blinders off my eyes. That I would know the reality of who you are. I want to know the truth. Just start praying. Start asking God for help. Start seeking God. I would encourage you to start attending church. Start going to a church. They don't know everything. They might not get everything right, but at least it's in the right direction. You know what I mean? So those are things I would encourage you to do. Um, if you have intellectual challenges to the Christian faith, I would encourage you to do this. Write out the most important ones. Because it's oftentimes people have kind of a scatterbrained list of challenges to the Christian faith where it's like, I've got a thousand things, a, th a million objections, potential objections to Christianity. And I think those aren't helpful because most of them are petty. And, and the reality is that once you start answering them, you realize you didn't care. So write out the things you actually care about. You know, maybe it's like two or three things. Maybe it's five things. And ask yourself, make your list. Maybe it's five, just really strong, important issues. And then ask yourself this. Does the truth of Christianity really depend on that question? And then cross off any on your list that don't actually have to do with whether Christianity is true. Right? Like, like let's say on your list is, I don't know the right way to interpret Genesis. Okay, but that's not about the truth of Christianity. Christianity's factualness or truthfulness is based upon the death and resurrection of Christ. It's not based upon proving every piece of scripture is factually true. Although I think it's all factually true. But I'm just saying that that's not the same thing. So I would, I would actually write down, what are my real issues here? And then chase those down. Now that you have just a couple, just three things, two things, one thing, chase that down. Look for good research. Look for strong Christians who've made a real good case on that issue as well. 
those are my pieces of advice for you. It's flawless and um, God bless you. I mean, really, God bless you and help you as you're on this journey, as you're on this journey. Be aware of yourself too. Um, the reality is, I'm going to speak you know, just as a convinced Christian, that the choice to follow Christ is not merely an intellectual thing about choosing to believe that the facts of Christianity are true. It's a decision that Jesus is going to be your Lord, right? It's like, you know, this would be wonderful and terrible in your life. It would bring costs right, of, of, of a changed life and changed attitudes about things, maybe even embarrassment in some cases, as, as some people would look down upon you for your new faith. But it would also bring the blessings and the benefits of knowing God for all eternity, of, of being forgiven of your sin, of, of finally having finally landed on something you can say is true. And be honest with yourself that these these really are things that weigh at you like the longing for the goodness of Christianity, but also the desire to not have to conform to it, the desire to not be embarrassed perhaps in front of others. These might be affecting you. Only you know your heart. I'm just throwing some stuff out there for you to think about. There's my advice. And uh, I'd love to hear an update on how you're doing at some point. Next question comes from Joshua Stuckey, who has a question. Uh, Mike, how do you read First Peter 1 Peter 1.3 in light of your rejection of the doctrine of total depravity? Many thanks for your thoughts. Your ministry is a huge blessing in my life. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I do reject total depravity. doesn't mean I don't think people are depraved, for those who don't know. Um, I think people are pretty messed up. And all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot work our way to heaven. It's only by God's grace that we can be saved, which is good news because it means all I do is trust. All I do is believe, right? All I do is trust in Christ, personal, relational trust in Christ. But I don't think total depravity is right, which is this idea, this Calvinist doctrine, although many Arminians hold to it as well. Um, the T is the most widely agreed upon piece in Calvinism, and it's it's something I don't agree on. So it would hold that you are so depraved that when God's reaching out, you hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit might be pulling on you in some fashion, drawing you, but you will always say, no, you'll, you'll reject the gospel every time. And the only reason you'll say in, in Calvinism, the only reason you'll say yes to the gospel is because God actually regenerates you. So this might sound weird to non-Calvinists, but according to Calvinism, this is key in Calvinism. And if, if you're a Calvinist, do not tell me I'm misrepresenting Calvinism here because then R.C. Sproul said that the key issue of Calvinism, and he got it all wrong, but um, but the uh, the key issue here is, you're regenerated before you're saved, before you have faith, excuse me. Regeneration comes before faith. That's where total depravity leads. Regeneration, you get regenerated first, then you have faith. Arminians handle this with something they call prevenient grace. Um, but I reject total depravity, so I don't handle it at all. Uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the verse. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Um, so I think this is based upon a, maybe a misunderstanding of what I mean when I reject total depravity. I do think God causes us to be born again because I don't, when I trust, when I say yes to Jesus, when I go, yes, I want the gospel. Yes. I want salvation. Yes. I want to be saved. I am not causing myself to be born again. My faith isn't causal here. It's not causing anything. It's required, but it's not causal. What makes me born again is God. God, he, he regenerates me. He saves me. My faith doesn't like cause my salvation in that sense. So I, with my doctrine, I would just affirm this without much caveat. I would just say, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And there you go. That'd be my response. Um, 13, next question. K Channel says, can someone be justified without being sanctified? In other words, can someone live a lifestyle of habitual sin and still be saved? Okay, to the first question, I'm going to say, ish. <laughs> can someone be justified without being sanctified? Well, like, ish. Okay. Being sanctified is an ongoing process, right? But but justification in the sense that, in, now there's different ways to use the term justification. There's a sense in which in the future we will be justified, right? I'll stand before God as I'm like entering into eternal life and I will be justified by Christ at that moment. There's a sense in which that's true, but there's also a sense in which I'm justified now. The Bible uses these terms in different ways and we have to just acknowledge that. Like it's not, it's not like justification is only ever used for the first moment you get saved. It's, it's used in other ways as well. Sanctification is also used in other ways. There's a sense in which every Christian is sanctified as in set apart. Every believer has been set apart by God for his purposes. There's another sense in which we've been sanctified 
this is just the words not used in the same way all the time. We're, we're being sanctified, like I'm growing in holiness, I'm growing in righteousness as I live this life. Okay, so I'm being refined, I'm being changed, I'm, I'm a more mature Christian today than yesterday. Okay, so in that sense, I go, can someone be justified without being sanctified? Well, yes and no, it depends on what you mean by the terms. I think everybody who's truly saved is on the process of sanctification. God is working in your life. You've been given the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has fruit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. I think that when you, when you think about what salvation is, I'm born again. I have a new life. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I have an intimate relationship with God. Jesus is my Lord and I'm now freed from sin because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So to say that this has no effect on my life seems odd seems very strange. And I think the, the apostles thought that was strange too. So the next question you have, and this one's more specific, can someone live a lifestyle of habitual sin and still be saved? Um, I want to say this. Salvation changes you. And if you show no changes in your life, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you don't have the evidence that you're saved. So I'm, I want to be very careful here. I don't mean that if somebody gives their life to Christ and they show no fruit, I'm going to say you are not saved. Rather, what I'm going to say is I don't have the proof that you're saved. I'm curious. I don't know anymore if you're saved or not. I don't, and it's not my job to figure it out, so I'm not stressing about it, but, but I can't have confidence in your salvation. And if I was you, I wouldn't have confidence in my own. That is a scary thing. We should be on a path of sanctification in some sense. We should ideally should be able to look at our lives and say, God, since you entered my life, things have been changing. But when I say, what about habitual sin? I think most Christians do have habitual sin in their lives. There's still pride that you're struggling with 20, 30 years later. I mean, the biggest sin issue that I deal with in all honesty is just lack of love towards people. I'm amazed at, and my poor wife, I'm amazed at how often I, and not that I abuse her or something like that. <laughs> I think I'm a good husband, but I'm amazed at how often like, I do something, I mean, I, I give her a harsh word or I miss, just just don't think of her, mistreat her in some fashion. I mean, I don't put my hands on my wife or anything like that. I never have. I don't call her names. We, we don't yell at each other, none of those things. But I still look back at it and I go, at, like a moment later, that wasn't loving. I wasn't very thoughtful. And if I was aware of all the sins and all the failures, all the shortcomings I have every day, I would probably call that habitual sin too. So I don't know how to draw the line. I just know there's some kind of line. There, there's, there's, you know, if I was living, if I look at my life honestly and I just ask, does it look like I'm a Christian? And if the answer is no, it looks like I'm not, then maybe I should just honestly say, maybe something's wrong in my commitment to Christ. Maybe I'm not being genuine here. What's the solution then? Get your, your, yourself genuine. Follow Christ for real. Live out this Christian faith for real. And then bear the fruit of a genuine faith in Christ. And it's just fruit. We're just examining fruit here. We're not really sure what the root is. We're looking at the fruit. But yeah, so my answer is, um, if someone's in that habitual lifestyle of sin, it depends on what you mean by that. Someone's sweating bullets over stuff that is, we would all look at them and say, dude, you're obviously saved. You're just still growing in Christ. And somebody else is living in like, they, they've had a 10 year long affair. They're sleeping around with other women instead of their wife. They're, they're embezzling they're, They lie all the time. And they're like, I'm a Christian. I go to church. And it's so weird that we're so bad at assessing ourselves in this. So that's what makes me cautious about answering a question like this very clearly is that we're all terrible at self-assessment, but yet at some point you have to self-assess. You got to test yourself, whether you're in the faith, do you not know that you're in Christ and ask, has my life been transformed by Jesus? And if not, don't give up, just get serious about Jesus. That's the only solution. All right. Next question. Ethan Hawking says, this is purely hypothetical. But how would you respond to the suggestion that the disciples' confidence in the resurrection was produced by the Mandela effect? Okay, I think, full disclosure, I'm going to be very honest. I think people who believe the Mandela effect are very foolish. I really believe that. And I want you to think, if you have fallen for the Mandela effect stuff, there's something wrong in your reasoning. Like, you don't think clearly about things. This doesn't mean you're a bad person compared to other people or something like that. It just means like you got to stop. You have to stop. I was with a family member recently and they said, I'm not kidding you. This is, this is what Mandela effect sounds like to me. They said, 
and I love my family. I love them. But this was silly. <laughs> um, so one, one of my relatives said this, a younger person said, um, have you noticed that we haven't seen any ants recently? I haven't seen any ants recently. Yeah, somebody was telling me they thought that the solution to this strange phenomenon is that we have entered into a parallel reality where there are no ants. This is ridiculousness. <laughs> like... I don't know how to help somebody who thinks this. Like, if you believe in the Mandela effect, like, you're just a gullible person. Like, I'm sorry, you guys, slow down. You're just being very, very gullible. So, here's the hypothetical. How would you respond to the suggestion that the disciples' confidence in the resurrection was produced by the Mandela effect? I would respond that that is very foolish and it doesn't fit reality in any way, shape, or form. The Mandela effect isn't real, can't be proven, is... And, and if you're going to tell me, well, but Darth Vader didn't say... Luke, I'm your father. He said, no, I'm your father. And I'm like, what? We're all quoting a movie wrong. And now you believe that reality is fundamentally like glitchy. <laughs> all right, I'm moving on. So yeah, I, 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 I would, what I would do is I would turn the tables on the person in, a, in Ethan. If you're having a conversation with someone who says this, make them prove it. Okay, there is a mountain of historical evidence to prove the resurrection of Christ. There is literally a phrase, Mandela effect. That's the proof they've got. So make them prove it. Make them meet the burden of evidence we have for the resurrection, all this evidence. Make them meet that with the Mandela effect and see if you can break through. But it's hard to talk to somebody when their reasoning is that flimsy. All right, moving on. I hope I haven't hurt anybody's feelings, but you needed it <laughs> if it was you. Creative liberty. Do the non-believers who have died or will get their physical bodies back, um, oh, do the non-believers who have died or will die get their physical bodies back at the final judgment? I know we will, but does scripture mention this about those who reject Christ? Um, sort of, yeah. Let me take you to a passage, Revelation chapter 20. We're going to read some of Revelation 20 here. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain. And there's a lot of symbolism here. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who's called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then we get to like the sort of like final judgment moment. Verse four. Then I saw thrones and... Um, Seated on them were those who, to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had been, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. These are the saved. These are the saved. He saw their souls. They, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, these would be the unsaved did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So we know for sure, like the resurrection we experience as believers is bodily. Uh, we're going to get a, a new body. It'll be a different body. It'll be, it'll be an eternal body um, fit for heaven, fit for the heavens is what first Corinthians 15 teaches us. So there's a parallel of some kind of resurrection that these other unsafe people are going to get. The rest of them, they come to life later at the end of the thousand years. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests. And um, I think actually I might be mistaking my, maybe my memory is just flawed here. The way I'm reading the text here, this phrase, the first resurrection seems like it's speaking of, I need to look at this more carefully, actually. I hate to do that live on camera here, but I really do need to look more carefully because the blessed are ho and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. And I was taking this to be a reference to those who are receiving a physical resurrection of after death death and they're not saved where's the verse i'm looking for here well i mean there's a little bit more in revelation 20 11. i saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them and i saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and books were open and another book was open which was the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead. And this is this is clearly, okay, this is clearly unsaved. I'm gonna have to pause on the other one. I'm, I'm gonna have to go look at it freshly when I'm not uh, on camera, like trying to grab all my, random, all my random thoughts. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And um, 
man, I, I want to give you a specific verse to answer your question. I'm just going to hold off on this. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that <laughs> I'm convinced that the, and forgive me, I'm just stumbling over my lack of memory here that the, the dead who are not in Christ, they do receive a physical body. There's a debate on what is that physical body like? Is it the same as their previous physical body? Is it not? Obviously, I'm not really able to answer that question in detail right now because my mastery over this passage is really weak sauce. So I'm just going to move on. Yeah, I think they get a body. What's that body like exactly? I'm not sure. And um, man, I wish I could answer that one better. I'm... I'm, I'm uh, 14 good ones and one really lame one. All right, 16, Elijah Roman says, Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. When Peter tries to rebuke him from deny or dying in Jerusalem, but Satan entered into Judas, leading him to betray Jesus. Was Satan divided against himself? Um, so that's a great question. Yeah. Um, that This is why I'm very cautious with the Peter. I used Peter as an example earlier of somebody who may have had like a demonic thought put into his head. That's possible. Um, does this mean that if that's the case, if, if Peter is getting this idea from Satan, when he says to Jesus, no, Lord, no, Lord, I don't want you to go down that road. I don't want you to die. Um, is it possible that this is like an actual demon putting this idea in his head? The answer to this would be, if so, then I would, I would venture a guess that the demon just wants Peter to argue with Jesus. Like the whole plan here isn't that. Uh, Satan doesn't want to kill Jesus. If he just wants division, right? Satan just, he's the, he's, he is definitely one who causes division in the body of Christ. So it's not that he cares about what Jesus is like, I'm going to die in Jerusalem. Satan wants that to happen. He wants Peter to argue with Jesus publicly. He wants to create division amongst Jesus and the disciples. I think that would be the agenda there. So Satan may have inspired the thought or, or, or perhaps inspired him being so urgent about it that he would openly rebuke Jesus. That may have been the case. Or it's possible that Jesus is just saying, um, get behind me, Satan is just, you're an adversary to the plans of God right now. Peter, if you fight against this, you're fighting against God like Satan does. So it may not have been assigning spiritual motive or spiritual sources behind it. It may have just been saying, this is just a demonic thing. Like it's evil. It's like the demons, not from the demons. Does that make sense? So yeah, um, Satan then enters Judas. He obviously wants to kill Jesus. That's his motive for sure. All right. Question 17. Susan says, a friend is afraid to have kids because she's afraid they'll reject Jesus. She would feel guilty for having them if they went to hell and doesn't want to take the chance. How should I respond? Um, uh, well, I mean, this is challenging because what you're dealing with here is human fear and not rational. It's not like there's a biblical reason going on here. Um, I understand the fear. What if my kids reject Christ? The worst case scenario. What I would say to people is that God thinks it's worth it to take this chance with us. He made you. God thinks it's worth it to take this chance. And I'll also say that your kids as they grow up, as, as much as you think of them as your babies and you want to protect them from making choices, this is not good parenting. Good parenting prepares them for choices. It doesn't forbid them from choices. And if they make choices to be drug addicts and to commit suicide, and this would wreck your heart. It would damage your life. It would really be hard to live with that kind of scenario. But it was their choice. It was still their choice. And robbing from them the ability to make choices is itself wrong, I think. So I think that God's willing to give us those choices and we should be willing to give those choices to others. That's my opinion about that. I think that we have evidence from it from scripture that God does this with us. Choose you this day who you will serve. There's such a value in choosing the life you'll live. It's so valuable when you make the right choices that it's worth the risk of you making the wrong ones. That'd be my encouragement. Um, and I would also want to, if it was my buddy, my friend, I'd want to talk to her um, about what other motives she might have for not wanting to have kids. Like if you could just have like a real open conversation where you're not trying to be judgmental, you're just trying to kind of pull out the details. Like, you know, let me understand. You don't have to force her to have kids. She doesn't have to have kids, but that, that seems like a strange reasoning to go on there. Number 18, True West says, what is your take on scholarship that attempts to alter our common understanding of the Old Testament by questioning the traditions or our understanding of the culture? They want to alter understanding of the Old Testament by questioning translations or our understanding of the culture. I have no problem with that if they're right. But if they're wrong, 
it's really messed up. <laughs> and so this is the danger of scholarship. Because for most human beings, most of you listening, not everybody, but most of you, when someone says, scholars say, or scholarship says, or in the original language it really means, you probably have to extend them some level of trust because you're not able to vet and research all the, all the claims they're about to make. So if they're giving you good info, it's fantastic. You're getting better understanding. You're carefully understanding and knowing the word of God. This is great. If they're giving you bad info, they're talking over your head and using your trust to, to deceive you about the scriptures. Ooh, so it's either really good or really bad. I, I think this is why it tells us in scripture that teachers are judged more strictly I'm judged more strictly because as I give you advice, I give you input, I give you statements about the word of God, like I better be right. And if I'm wrong, I'm accountable for you now believing and behaving based upon wrong thinking. This is, this is a big thing. And so I know from reading scholars that scholarship is a very mixed bag. And there's plenty of scholars out there who are going to use their prestige and the authority you place on them to give you a wrong image of scripture and a wrong image of God. And there's others who will use their prestige and the trust you give them to give you a right image of Christ and a right image of God. I want to know things like, um, you know, when Paul says about um, those who were circumcised don't seek to be uncircumcised. Okay, he says this in Galatians, really strange phrase. I want to know that culturally there was an actual Roman, like or Greco-Roman procedure where they would try to uncircumcise somebody. They would do a, a medical procedure and he goes, don't do that. And so I realized, oh, this was like an actual thing. Like that's a cultural understanding that helps me understand the passage better. I like that. Um, when they're reclining at the table with Jesus and, and John's laying against him or he leans against him. I, I want to know that at fancy dinners, they would recline. In particular at Passover, the Jews would be at a, like a reclined, kind of relaxed, long, long meal, very long meal. And they'd sit there and recline and they might lean against each other. And that was culturally normal. I want to know that because then it helps me to, basically to refute the people who are going to act like maybe John and Jesus had like intimate things going on because everybody wants to read their perversions into scripture. And so that, that helps protect against that. So I want to know these things, but, but yeah, um, scholarship is a mixed bag. The best you can do is try to. Um, as a Christian, if you don't know scholars, you don't know, if you can't read and research it on your own is try to make sure you have teachers you feel you can trust and also realize this, realize when you're about to change your whole belief system because you just trust some scholar's word. That's a scary moment because your entire faith is hanging upon this one scholar and their views on things. And, and that, uh, just notice that, notice that when in doubt, ignore everybody and just read your Bible and you'll, you'll be better off than just taking somebody's random word for it. Number 19, skeptic reviews says in the gospel of Mark, since Jesus, since Jesus talked about the son of man in the third person, that means Jesus was talking about someone else. Where in the book of Mark does Jesus directly say he is the son of man? Well, let's take a look. So um, I don't have a, a verse right off the top of my head. Like I know I have all the son of man phrases in Mark ready to go. But give me a second to pull out a few. Just a moment. Okay. Um, let's read these and let's test the hypothesis that Jesus does not mean himself when he says son of man. So um, the first one we'll look at is Mark 2.10. Um, but, you, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, rise, take your bed and go home or pick up your bed and go home. Okay, that's the first occurrence of Son of Man in the Gospel of Mark. How does Jesus use it? Um, he's talking about himself. It's very clear, actually. So this man wants to be healed. The paralytic wants to be healed. He comes down. Jesus sees him and he tells him, son, your sins are forgiven. They freak out. Who do you think you are? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Like you don't have the authority to forgive sins. And then Jesus says, what do you think is easier to say to this paralytic, the guy right here, your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home to argue that Jesus is not referring to himself. Um, I think is impossible uh, to do it well. And he tells the guy you're forgiven. You guys claim I can't forgive. Oh yeah. The son of man can forgive. I'll prove it. Get up, take your bed and go home. The guy gets up, he has, he takes his bed and he goes home. So there's the first occurrence of son of man in the gospel of Mark. Jesus is obviously using it about himself. 
Then in Mark 8, 31, we have another occurrence of Son of Man. And it says here, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. That's clearly about himself. Jesus clearly is thinking he's the one that's going to suffer, be rejected, die, and then rise again. He repeats this several times in the Gospel of Mark. He says it plainly. Peter knows he's talking about himself, which is why he rebukes Jesus. Then he says, get behind me. You're not, you're not, uh, you're not following, you're not following me. And let's see that that's another occurrence. Uh, we have other ones. So in Mark chapter nine. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no, uh, tell no one the things they had seen till the son of man had risen from the dead. <laughs> He's obviously talking about himself. I don't know how anybody, oh, I'm sorry. The text is so small. Uh, Mark nine, nine. There you go. But Jesus is obviously speaking about himself. He's predicting his own death and resurrection. He's talking about his death and resurrection. Mark is all about his death and resurrection. So Jesus in this, I mean, if you're going to take Mark as even remotely reliable, Jesus obviously thinks that the son of man is, is Jesus. He obviously thinks it's himself. I could go on. We could read other places in the gospel of Mark. Um, in Mark 14, 21, this is a passage I'll be teaching here this, this week. Jesus says about himself, he goes, that one of them is going to betray him, right? Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. He means the disciples. One of the disciples will betray him. Then in verse 20, they're, at, well, they're asking him in verse 19, is it I? They're all like, who is it? Who's going to betray you? And he says, it's somebody di dipping the bread in the dish with me. It's one of you here at this Passover meal. Then he says, for the son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the son of man is betrayed. But he just said, someone's going to betray me. And then he says, and woe to the person who betrays the son of man. It, it's very obvious he's talking about himself. So I don't think on any even casual reading of the gospel of Mark, we could get the idea that the son of man is someone other than Jesus. I think that seems pretty solid there. And question number 20, the potter, by the way, uh, skeptic reviews. Thank you very much for your question. I'm glad you're here. And I'm grateful that you, uh, you sent that in. Uh, the potter's daughter says, will sins be publicly exposed to an assembly or those we've sinned against at the Bema seat, uh, before being erased or forgiven? I've heard people say this before. Let's look at the, you gave two verses. Let's look at those two verses real quick. The first one you gave is 1 Corinthians 5.10. And the Bema seat is the, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That word Bema is the Greek word. And it refers to like this, this judgment seat of Christ that we'll all stand before. Um, and um, 1 Corinthians 5.10 was the first verse you used. And this is about who's not going to be saved is the people who are living lifestyles of ongoing sin, which is again, why that brings into question your salvation. If you're, if you're living this extreme lifestyle of, of sin, um, I don't see how that weighs into the current discussion. L the other verse you gave is Luke 12 verses two through three. Jesus says, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you have whispered in, in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. So yeah, this is talking about like, yeah, there's, so there's some sense here's this verse very much relates. There's a sense. And I think Jesus is talking about future judgment. That's my impression on this passage. There's a sense in which things that happen in secret are publicly known. Um, however, let me add something. This seems to be, to be more talking about the unsaved than the saved. It's possible it could apply to the saved, the Bema seat, which is something that the saved go to, which is like a judgment for rewards. Um, it may also apply to them, but but I think that the text is specifically about the unsaved here. He's he's watching out the leaven of the Pharisees and he's like, it's all going to be uncovered. Everything's going to be known. You could say it's about Christians too. Um, as a Christian, it's, I mean, I have heard pastors say that like when we die, like, we're going to be effectively, I've even heard this description given that we're all going to sort of be brought up one at a time during judgment. Now, this isn't maybe a popular teaching, but I heard a pastor say this and on our, on a TV screen, everything's going to play. Everything in your life is going to play and everyone's going to see it. And so I don't know if he really meant like a TV screen, but, but he obviously thought everything I've done will be very public and publicly known. Um, I don't know. It might be. There's a chance. And if it is, it's going to be a really shameful moment for all of us. Um, but then we'll all be in the same playing field. I mean, if that were to happen to everybody and all of the sinful thoughts 
and deeds that I've ever committed were known fully to those I'm in heaven with. And I knew all theirs. I mean, it would be horrible at the moment, but at the same time, afterwards, it would be like, we're all just so aware of the grace of God at that point. So I, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even complain. I mean, I wouldn't like it, <laughs> but I wouldn't complain. It would be like, look at what his grace has covered. Or will we be in heaven and I'll privately know what I've been forgiven of, but maybe others won't. I don't know. I don't know. Um, this phrase that nothing's covered that will not be revealed, it could be a reference to perhaps not so much public knowledge, but God's going to uncover it. Like between you and God, everything will be known. God will know all of your issues, all of your sins, all of it. But maybe that's not about it being known to everybody publicly. Maybe that doesn't emphasize that so much because it just says nothing's covered up that will not be revealed. So yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure that the scripture answers that question. Or maybe it doesn't. I just haven't seen that answer. So the potter's daughter, there's my thoughts. If it happens, I'm okay with it. I don't like it. But I'll, <laughs> but I think it will increase, in the end, our grace, our, our attitude towards God's grace and each other. And um, and if it doesn't happen, then that's nice too. <laughs> okay. All right, we got a little bonus question. And the bonus question is from Spazzy Jazzy who says, is uh, Israel is a, real, is a real realm of rest, but is... Israel really real? Okay, <laughs> sort of a question. <laughs> Israel is a real realm of rest, but is Israel really real? Is this just, I think it's just a tongue twister. All right, here, here's my parting tongue twister for you guys. A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. Can you, can you say that fast? Can you say it as fast as I do? A box of biscuits, a box of mixed biscuits, and a biscuit mixer. I challenge you. I challenge you to do that. Have fun with that today. <laughs> All right, that's it. God bless you. I will see you Monday at 1 p.m. for the Mark live stream. We're going to go through the Gospel of Mark. We're in the Passover meal right at the end. And in the meantime, here's one passing thought for you, one parting thought, other than my horrible tongue twister. Um, everything that you're seeing in your life right now, you're seeing from, from today. And you know, when you look back at your life, like you look back 10 years from 10 years ago, you look at 10 years ago so much differently than you do, than you do now. Well, now you're in now. Now is the worst time to figure out what's going on now. Now, if you're going through hard times, hardships, difficult things, now is not the time to have tenure, pretend you have the perspective of 10 years from now. But as Christians, our ultimate perspective will come in eternity. You'll be in glory and in great joy forever. That's when you will know what was going on today. That's when it will make more sense to you. Until then, you just, you just walk in faith. You just trust in God and you rest in him giving you that bedrock that keeps you from getting down too low. All right, God bless you.